I want you to go with me over to 1 Samuel chapter number 18. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. The last couple of uh, Sundays, we have been looking into uh, friendship on Sunday mornings. And uh, I wanted to take just a few moments tonight just filling in uh, this evening for this Sunday School Hour. I want to take just a moment and talk to you about friendship from the Word of God. We've been talking about our friendship with uh, the Lord and on Sunday mornings in the book of John. Uh, we've been looking at what friendship with Jesus looks like and what it is to be called a friend of Jesus. And then this morning we looked at some of the ramifications of that and what it is to be a friend of the Lord and what to expect in relationship with our relationship to the world, to those that are lost around us. But I want to talk specifically this evening about our relationship and our friendships with one another as believers. And I want to take us to the life of two Old Testament characters and uh, if we talk about friendship or anytime friendship is mentioned in the Bible or, or that someone talks specifically about two people and their friendships, probably you think about the names David and Jonathan and you are drawn to that when you think about friendships in the Word of God. It's because we see the relationship with them that it was so close a friendship and so close um, a camaraderie between the two that we automatically think about that when we think about friendships in the Word of God. Obviously, there are many more in other places that we could go to. We could talk about friendships of Paul and Barnabas and others in the New Testament. But I want to go through the life of, of David and Jonathan just quickly for a few moments this evening and talk about some of what it was that brought them together and what made their friendship such a, a wonderful friendship that we can look at and model after. There's a survey of more than 40,000 Americans who were asked what were the qualities that they valued the most in a friend. Uh, the, top, uh, the top quality that they said was the most valuable, I'll get the word out in a moment, that was the most valuable to them was that, they, that someone had the ability to, uh, to have their, their trustworthiness, they were ability to trust them, and that they had the ability to keep confidences. Number two was loyalty, and number three was uh, warmth and affection, they said. And uh, so we all desire some of these quality traits in a good friend. But what does the Bible say about friendships? And what does the Bible say uh, about this in, in the Old Testament characters of David and Jonathan in particular here? Let's look at some things this evening. You're in 1 Samuel chapter number 18. If you're taking notes, I'll give you four thoughts in particular this evening. First of all, we see in their friendship that they were connected by their love. They were connected by their love. And we live in a day and age in which we are becoming less and less connected to one another. We are living in a day and an age and a time where there are things that are supposed to connect us, such as social media and such as uh, phones, smartphones, and I mean, we have the ability to reach around the world. We have the ability to talk to each other instantaneously. We have the ability to know what's going on in everybody's life. Too much sometimes. <laughs> Too much sometimes. We have the ability with Facebook and with Instagram and with Twitter and with all of these different platforms, we have the ability to take a picture, to see everything that's going on, take a video, know all this. And those are things that are supposed to connect us. Yet in a society where everything is supposed to be connected, we are living less and less connected to each other. We are actually, as far as connection goes, going further and further apart. There was a study that was done just a few years ago, and you would think with all of what we have to be connected with today that people would be becoming less lonely and more and more connected. Yet, in the age group of 18 to 30-some-year-olds, those people registered now of being more lonely than those over the age of 55. It was the first time in the study that it had been done, it was the first time that that age group registered as being the most lonely group 
You think, well, what in the world? What has happened here? What's happened is we're not with one another. We're not, being, we're not connecting face to face in a way in which we once did. And we're going to talk about some ways in which David and Jonathan were connected. And, and oftentimes, uh, that is what is needed in friendships. Now, it's great to be able to pick up with someone where you left off before. It's great even when you're separated by distance that you can come back together. And true friendships, you can come right back in and get right back into that friendship once again, even after being uh, disconnected physically for a while speaking. But this connection is something that is very important when it comes to friendship. Notice, first of all, they were connected by love. The Bible says in Proverbs 17 and verse 17, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. When does a friend love? At all times, all the time. They were connected by their love for one another. Notice in 1 Samuel chapter number 18, the Bible says in verse number 1, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Uh, What is it that the Bible says here about Jonathan's love for David? It says that he loved him like he loved his own soul. Multiple times, I think at least four different times in Jonathan's life, here a couple of times in this passage and then a couple more times throughout his life that's mentioned with him and David, it says that he loved him as his own soul. He loved him as his own soul. He loved him as his own soul. You know what kind of love we have for ourselves? We have the kind of love for ourselves that we want the best for us. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, the Bible talks about how husbands ought to love their wives and how they ought to love them as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that we ought to love our wives, that no man ever hated his life, but he nourisheth and cherisheth it, and that's the way we're to love our wives. But when it comes to friendship, that's the way that we are to love as well. We ought to love one another as, we, as he loved his own soul. In other words, he loved him like he, like he was him. He, he loved him as much as he loved himself. He loved him in a way that said, listen, I am willing to, I understand who you are and who you're going to be. And watch this. It says there in verse number three that David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and he gave it to David. What was the robe? Who was Jonathan? He's the son of Saul. He is not just any son of Saul. He's the oldest son of Saul. He is the prince who is in line for the kingdom. Now, I realize that Saul is the first king of Israel, but that's the way that things worked in uh, in old times and in old days and in biblical times. That's the way it worked. A king had a son. The eldest son became the next king. That's still the way it works in, in royalty and that sort of thing today. You have a son. The eldest son is the one who takes over the kingdom. Jonathan's in line to be the king of Israel, and yet he takes off his princely robe and he gives it to David. He takes off that which set him apart as a prince of Israel, and he takes it off and he says, Here, David, this is for you. Oh, and by the way, here's my sword, here's my armor, here's my girdle, here's my belt that pulls it all together and ties it all up again. I'm giving you everything. I want you to have all of this. I want this to be for you. He, He had a love that had some action to it. Let me ask you, do your friends know that you love them by the things that you do for them? We talked about this a little bit uh, a couple of Sundays ago. We were talking about our love for the Lord and what it produces in us and what we do. Love is an action. It's not just a feeling. Love isn't just something that says, hey, you know I love you, right? I mean, you know I love you. And you're sitting there going, "Uh uh-huh. Sure you do, right? You, you've had somebody, I'm sure you've had somebody in your life, don't look at anybody right now, okay? I'm sure you've had somebody in your life, though, who they say, hey, I love you, and you're like, love you too. 
<laughs> yeah, sure you do. And that's what you're thinking down inside, right? But love is not just saying it. It's not just a feeling. It's an action. Jonathan, the Bible says he makes a covenant with David, and it says that multiple times in his life. He made a covenant with him, and he makes him promise things to him. He says because he loved him so much, and because he loved him as he loved his own soul. And it wasn't just a, oh yeah, I love you, I care about you, but no, I'm going to show it. He takes off his, his uh, princely garments and, and gives him his, his coat and gives him his sword and gives him his uh, artillery and gives him everything that he has and shows his love for David. David shows his love for Jonathan. I want you to flip over in 2 Samuel. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 1. We're, just, we're going to be flipping around for a little bit, looking at some different instances in these men's lives and, and what the Bible speaks of their love for one another and other things that connected them. But in 2 Samuel chapter 1, in verse number 26, David has received the news. This is many, many, many a year later now. David has received the news of Jonathan's death. David has received the news that, that Saul and Jonathan and his sons have been killed in battle. And David begins in, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, he begins to talk and he begins to talk about Saul and Jonathan. And in verse number 25 he says, How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Now there are some who have taken that and made something out of it that is not. Okay, There is in no way any type of a wrong relationship uh, or, or wrong physical relationship of any kind that was going on between David and Jonathan. The words here don't even hint at that or towards that whatsoever. What David is saying here is he's saying that there, there was such a love for Jonathan, there was such a love that they had for one another, there was a friendship that they had that David is distressed and he's hurting over the loss of his friend. Why? Because he loved him. Because there was such a love, that, that there was such that bond there that connected them in friendship and he's hurting over the loss of this. There's another instance where uh, they are together and uh, that David realizes that he's not going to see Jonathan. He's not going to be able to be around Jonathan anymore because Saul is coming after David and he finds out that, that Saul's really after him again. And, and, and he cries and he's distressed because he loves uh, Jonathan so much that, that, that it's, that's tearing him apart that they're no longer going to be able to be together. And the Bible says that they both wept until David exceeded. I mean, he was just, he was, he was boohooing, okay? That's about the only way to put it. He's boohooing. I mean, he is crying. He's in distress because he's not going to be able to be with and be around and have that closeness of fellowship with Jonathan anymore. It shows the love that they had one for another. The Bible tells us that that's the same way that we are to love one another. Come to New Testament time, come to the church age time, and Peter writes, and he says in 1 Peter 1, he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, and then he puts a word there on the end of it, fervently, fervently. How are we to love one another? What's our love supposed to be like as brethren? What's our love supposed to be like in our friendships? We are to love fervently. It ought to be shown. There ought to be something that others know that, that they are our friends and that we love them and that we care about them. Peter would go on and write just a couple of chapters later in 1 Peter 4, 8, and he says, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You say, what's charity? Charity is that agape love, that love with no strings attached. That's what that charity is. That charity is that love where God loved us. You say, how can you have uh, that kind of love? Only through the Lord. 
Only through the Lord are we able to have that kind of love for one another. Only through Christ in our life are we able to love one another with that kind of love that says no strings attached. I love you and I'm going to fervently love you and I'm going to have fervent charity towards you simply because you're my friend. And simply because you are my brother or sister in Christ, I am going to love you the way that God loves you. I'm going to love you the way that God loves people. I'm going to show you the kind of love that I have. David and Jonathan had a love for one another in their friendship that showed just how close they were and just how connected they were one with another. They were connected by their love in so much that it was able to be said of them that they loved each other as their own soul. Notice this, they were connected by their love for one another. This is important though here, this is important as believers, they were connected in the Lord. They were connected in the Lord. See, we start here in for going back now to 1 Samuel chapter number 18, we see the first time that they are introduced to one another. 1 Samuel chapter number 18 tells us, It came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. All right, what is it that has just transpired and taken place here? David has just taken on Goliath. Okay, and he's just come back from the victory, and he's just come back, and the Bible says that he came and he was able, that, that David comes back and he talks with Saul. And we don't know everything that was said and everything that goes on there, but we know some of what David had said to Saul when he came. David, at this point in time, David's just a, a, a teenager probably somewhere around 17 years old at this point in time. He is uh, coming and and he tells Saul, uh, listen, I'll go and fight the Philistine. I mean, he's come down to this battle and nobody else is willing to go and fight. David's got a couple of older brothers who are there. By the way, remember how when Samuel got ready to go anoint one of Jesse's sons, he saw Eliab and he looks at him and he's like, there's God's anointed right there. That's got to be who's going to be the next king. I mean, look at that strong guy right there. Man, he is a warrior. He is definitely who God, and it wasn't him. And then others pass through. Shammah comes by. And he's like, well, maybe, eh, nope. All, all six of them pass through, and they're like, wait. Samuel's like, don't you have any more sons? Is there any more? And uh, just little David out there, he's taking care of the sheep. He says, we're not going to eat until he comes. You better bring him here. And God says to Samuel, listen. Don't look on the height of his stature. Don't look at what his countenance, don't look at what he looks like. The Bible says he was just, he was ruddy, he was just a youth. But the Bible says that David had a heart for the Lord. And God said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or the height of his stature because I have refused him. God doesn't see the way that man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And God saw that David had a heart for the Lord. And Jonathan saw that in David as well. And when David came and he talked to Saul, he says to Saul, let, no, let not thy heart fail. Um, I'll go. I'll fight for Israel. I'll fight for the Lord. And he does. And a great victory is wrought that day in Israel. And we see the same heart for the Lord and a desire to take a stand for Israel and to to defeat the enemy. We see that same desire to do that that was in David's life and the same courage that he had in the Lord in his life. We see that in Jonathan's life as well. There's a passage of scripture a little bit later on that speaks about Jonathan. If you remember, Jonathan goes... And, and Jonathan, they're fighting against the Philistines, and it's just Jonathan and his armor bearer. And Jonathan goes up with his armor bearer, and he says, listen, we're going to go, and we're going to make ourselves known to that group of Philistines down there. And if they call out to us, and they say, hey, stay right there, we're going to come up there, he said, then we're getting out of here. This isn't of the Lord. But he says, if it be the Lord's will... We're going to call out, they're going to see us, and they're going to say, 
hey, come on down here to us and, we'll, and let us show you something. And they said, if that's what happens and that's what takes place, then we're going to go down. We're going to know that we can have the victory through the Lord. And the Bible says that that day that Jonathan went and his armor bearer, and they started a great victory that day. They go down to this host, this encampment of the Philistines, and, and they just start going through, and Jonathan is going through, and he's meeting them head on, and he's going through, and he's knocking these guys out, and his armor bearer is coming behind him and finishing them off, and it paints a very beautiful, lovely picture of uh, two guys just going through and going through battle and going through the war there. But uh, what we see there is that they both had a heart for the Lord and a things of of the Lord and they both had their courage in the Lord and they both had a heart's desire to serve God to trust in him and to do what he desired and what was best for his people and that's exactly one of the things that connected them together go with me and look in 1st Samuel chapter number 20 you're in chapter 18 go over to 1st Samuel chapter number 20 and look there with me at verses Number 41 and verse number 42. I want you to see this heart that they had for the Lord. It showed through and in different times in different areas of their life. They both had a heart for the Lord. They both trusted in the Lord to help them. They both were courageous at times in the Lord in their life. But look at, at 1 Samuel chapter 20 in verses 41 and 42. The Bible says, as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground bowed himself three times, and they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. Here, here they are once again, both of them. We can see the heart for the Lord that they had, and they said, Listen, the Lord be between me and and thee. They are making a covenant between them and the Lord. They have sworn both of them in the name of the Lord. In other words, God is a part of their life and of what they are doing and of their future as they see it. Jonathan sees and understands David's going to be the next king. They're making an agreement here between each other multiple times. They are making a compact with one another. They are making a covenant with one another and they are doing it in the name of the Lord and they are saying the Lord be between me and you. We see their heart for the Lord and that is what brought them and one of the things that connected them and brought them together. Flip over at 1 Samuel chapter number 23 and in verse number uh, 16. We see just another instance. The Bible says, or look at verse 15. The Bible says, And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan Saul's son arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. This is Jonathan going out to David and strengthening him. In what? Strengthening him in, in God. Strengthening his hand in the Lord. Strengthening him in the, in, in, the, in the Lord here. Not David, like we would expect that David would be the one doing that for Jonathan. But it's Jonathan who's going out to David. We see their heart together for the things of the Lord. And because each of them individually had a heart for the Lord, together that brought them closer together and they had a greater connection because each of them had a heart for the Lord. They were connected in the things of the Lord. They had a common goal and a common pursuit of serving the Lord with their life. And listen, same thing is true in our friendships today. Same thing is true in our lives today. What is it that connects us with other believers, one of the things that connects us and brings us close to our friends and that brings us in close fellowship is our walk with the Lord. One of the things that brings us close together is the common goal that we have in desiring to serve the Lord with our life. One of the things that brings us close to, when you think about some of the closest friends that you have, or hopefully the closest friends that you have in life, are those who are following the same path, so to speak, that you are, that are walking in the same direction that you are. The Bible talks about how can two go together except they be agreed? You know, we have to be going in the right direction in order to, uh, to, to be together and be connected and be on the same page, so to speak. That is what's important 
in friendship. It's one of the things that is most important, I would say, in friendship. Young people, when you're choosing your friends in life and when you are choosing, let's say young people, but for the adults as well, when you're choosing friends and when you are, 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 are picking out people that you are going to invest in their life and have them invest in yours, make sure that it is people who have a heart for the Lord and who desire the same things that you desire as far as when it comes to the things of the Lord. They were connected by their love. They were connected uh, in the Lord. And then notice this as well. They were connected through their loyalty to one another. They were connected through their loyalty to one another. Look at 1 Samuel. Back up now a couple of chapters. 1 Samuel chapter number 19 at this point in time, we're going to begin reading here in verse number one. At this point in time, David, uh, David uh, or Saul has uh, already become jealous and envious of, of David and the attention that he's getting. It took one battle for David to come back from and uh, to, to have a great victory over Goliath. And they come back singing a song. David uh, or, or Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. And, and Saul looks at him and goes, that's it. I don't like him. That's it. I hate him. They like him more than they like me. That's not what friendship could ever be based on. But Jonathan and David's friendship was based on their loyalty to each other, that no matter what happened, no matter what took place, they were loyal to one another. Look, look we're, in, we're in chapter 19 there. The Bible says, verse number 1, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee. And what I see, that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to theeward very good. For he did put his life in his hand, and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul sware, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be Slain. Now, it doesn't take Saul long to change his mind on that and to go right back to hunting David again. But Jonathan is loyal to David in so much that his dad comes to him and says, Listen, anytime you get a chance, and for all the servants of Saul, when you get a chance, I want you to kill David. We want to kill him. We're going to kill him. And Jonathan is loyal to David. And he stands up and he says, why, why would you do that? He defends him. He says, listen, why in the world would you go about and try to do hurt and harm to the guy who has helped to bring salvation to Israel, a guy who helped and who went out and killed the Philistine with the Lord's help? Why would you do such wrong? He's not done any wrong to you. Why are you going to do that? David, or, or Jonathan, rather, stands up for David and shows his loyalty to David here and shows how much he cares about his friendship with David and, and, and enough that he would stand up to his own father, the king, and say, Dad, this is wrong. This is not right. He's not done anything wrong to you. Why would we try to hurt him? Now, later on, it's going to happen again that Saul is going to come after David and he, or, and he doesn't tell Jonathan. And David says, Jonathan, listen, your dad's coming after me. He wants to hurt me again. And, and they set up this whole thing where David's going to be gone for a few days. And, and Jonathan's going to say, hey, David asked me if he could go away. And, and, uh, and Saul is going to ask, you know, hey, Jonathan, where's he at? And Saul gets so mad at Jonathan that he takes the javelin that's next to him, and he throws it at his own son. But Jonathan is ever loyal to David. Jonathan comes to a point in place where he says, listen, I know that you are going to be the next king over Israel. He was loyal to a place where he said, it doesn't matter. I realize that even though I know this is what my dad wants, my dad wants the kingdom to stay in our line, but I know the Lord's taking and remove that from, from us, and it's going to go to you. And he shows his loyalty to David 
and understanding that and saying, you know, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm okay with that because I know it's what God wants. And he shows his loyalty again and again to David. David shows his loyalty to Jonathan. Flip over 2 Samuel. One of the last times that they are together, David and Jonathan make a pact with one another. They agree... We read, we read about it a moment ago in chapter number 20 where they agree and they make a pact that David and Jonathan are going to stay loyal to each other and that there's going to be a, uh, that, that David is not going to do any harm to Jonathan's family even after he becomes king. Jonathan realizes the position that David will be in. He says, listen, uh, I'm asking you that you would not do any harm. And they make a pact between themselves and the Lord that David would not do that. And David stays loyal and true to that. In 2 Samuel chapter number 9, David and, or, or Saul rather and Jonathan have already been killed in battle at this point in time. David is the king over all of Israel. And David says in, in chapter 9 verse 1, David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually." And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon me, such a dead dog as I am? And the king goes on and, and he tells Ziba, Listen, I want you to go, and you're, you and your, your children and, and, and the servants of, of Mephibosheth, you're going to work the land and you're going you're gonna to bring food but, and you're going to feed uh, your master's family and you're going to take care of your families and all. I'm giving you back the land of Saul. He says, But Mephibosheth is going to sit at my table. And Mephibosheth said, I, I love the rest of the chapter, how it reads in verse number 12, or, or verse number 11, Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for, Meshib, as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. As one of the king's sons. This was the loyalty that David shows to Mephibosheth in saying, listen, I know that he's gone. I know that I do not have my friend anymore, but I am still going to be loyal to him, and I'm still going to be kind and show some kindness unto him because that's how much he had a friendship with him, how much he cared about him. And he brought his son, and he brought him to his table, and he set him at his own table and fed him and treated him as if he were his own son. And what a wonderful picture of friendship and how that continues to go on. Why? Because they were connected by the love that they had for one another. They were connected by the Lord and by the things of the Lord in their life. They were connected by the loyalty that they had for one another. Oh, that we would have friendships that were that way, that we would be connected in the things of the Lord, and that our friendships that we have with our fellow brethren and our fellow uh, our sisters and our brothers in Christ, that we would come together in our friendships. By the way, God desires for us to have those kind of friendships. God desires for us to be close with one another. God desires for us to, to build upon that and to grow in that and to have a love like these two men had for one another and to have a friendship like they had for one another. It's important, I mentioned at the beginning, how we're living in a day and in a time when we are, are becoming less and less connected to each other. The things that are supposed to bring us together have actually in many ways taken us farther apart and farther away. And we're not as connected as we are. Uh, the, the author, Patrick Morley, writes 
And he says this, he says, while most men could recruit six pallbearers, almost nobody has a friend who could call at 2 a.m. You know, what a sobering and a sad thought. You know, God forbid that that would be our life story, that we wouldn't have a relationship uh, with those that are around us and with our friends in Christ, that, that we wouldn't be able to reach out, that we wouldn't be able to say, oh, yes, we can have a friendship like this. We can. We can when we're connected in the Lord, when we're connected by our love, by our charity for one another, and we're connected by our loyalty to each other to show that love and to stay faithful and true to our friends, we can have that kind of friendship. David and Jonathan, whenever friendships are mentioned in the Bible, we most oftentimes go straight to them and think, oh yeah, the friendship of David and Jonathan. But there were some things that kept that friendship and made it what it was. Oh, that we would take some of those principles and apply them to friendships in our life today. God desires for us to be that kind of friend. He desires us for us to have that kind of friend in our life. May we go forth and do that. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Start being the friend that you want somebody else to be to you. Oh, there's nobody like that that I can be friends with. I'm just not that kind of person that we can have friendships, and I don't know. Nobody seems to, I can't find anybody like that. Well, stop looking for somebody like that and start being that somebody. Start having and showing the love of Christ. Be loyal and, and, and be uh, always about the things of the Lord. And God will bring those friendships together. And there will be a bond that is there. We have to be looking for that uh, as well. And that's what the, the Lord does desire for us to have, is those friendships in our life. May we take and apply some of these principles tonight. Father, thank you for the time that we have had together. I pray that you would use this quick study on friendship tonight. I pray that you would 